Good morning, church family. Good morning, church family. Good morning. Let's stand together for the reading of God's word as we open our service. All right, we're going to, uh, we've been studying the book of Ephesians. We're going to open today with a passage from the book of Ephesians. Um, you would think that it would be something that we would remember, but we studied this so long ago. I think it's a great refresher for us this morning. This is from Ephesians 2. Chapter, um, chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Pray with me, please. Lord, thank you so much for gathering us here together today as your people. Lord, thank you that uh, we have a reason to celebrate. That's you, Jesus Christ, and we're here to celebrate you today. Lord, I pray that we would put aside the things that keep us from you, Lord. Help us to put aside those distractions and to lay our burdens at your feet right now. You're worthy to be praised, Lord, so may you receive our praise, and may we give it to you in spirit and in truth now. In your name we pray, Almighty One. Amen. Let's worship.
you are so worthy. Not, of every, not only of every breath that we can breathe, but every move that we can make, every thought that we can think. Lord, it's all because of the power of your Holy Spirit in us and the strength that you give us. There is none beside you, Lord. You are our firm foundation. And because of you and because of your strength that you give to us, we will never be shaken in Christ. We praise you. Amen. Good morning. My name, if you don't know who I am, my name is David Elms. I'm the commander here for the Iwana program at Country Oaks. There we go. Yeah, let's give it up. All right. So if you're not familiar with Iwana, Iwana stands for Approved Workmen Are Not Ashamed, based on 2 Timothy 2.15. And it's an international youth program. We've had it here at Country Oaks for years. And so I'm just going to pray for the group up here. But first, I'm going to explain a little bit about it. We start off with, in our, well, first of all, the goal of Awana is to reach boys and girls with the gospel of Christ. So what we do every week is they have a little book study, and they learn verses, and then they recite the verses and learn what the verses are. So really, we want to put it on their hearts. And then the kid, clubbers can actually go home and, and be missionaries at, in their families because they're getting excited, and they start talking about these verses. So we start off with three-year-olds, three- and four-year-olds in cubbies, Kindergarten through second grade in Sparks, third grade through sixth grade in TNT or Truth and Training. Our junior hires are in Trek and our high schoolers in Journey. We meet Wednesdays, 6 to 7.15. However, the Trek and Journey meet at 5 o'clock to do their study because at 6 o'clock we want to train them to serve him. So our Trek and Journey are then spread out through all the other clubs and they help out and learn to be leaders so when they get out of high school they can come back as leaders and many of them have. So we're really excited. Um, obviously in March we had to shut down like everybody else but about three weeks ago we were able to open up and the Lord has really blessed our club with 120 students. Students, I'm a, I work in education so clubbers. So we have 120 kids every Wednesday night and we're in need of some leaders. Um, there's two, there's three ways you can help. One, you can be a leader We'll plug you in. It's not a real large group, maybe 8 to 10, depending on the age level you want. Um, we do need somebody for junior high, which I know scares a lot of people, but they're good. Um, cubbies scare me. So, however, um, you can help with the leaders. Listeners, if you just want to come for a little bit and just sit there and listen to the clubbers say the verses to you, and you sign them off in their books, that would be a big help. And, of course, everybody can help with prayer. So if you're interested, if, it's, if the Lord's putting it on your heart to be a leader or a listener, check in the church office. Come get a hold of myself, Dave Elms, Matt Beiswinger can also help out. Or just come Wednesday night, this Wednesday, and we'll plug you in. Okay, so we'll find room for you. In the meantime, I want to pray for our club. So if you can bow your head. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we're just so thankful for the ability to have a one of clubs here at Country Oaks, Lord, just so thankful for the leaders we have. Lift them up. We know it's such a busy week, and yet they come every week to be with these precious children. Also, Lord, we lift up all the clubbers, that they open their hearts, that they learn your word, and they, and they really understand, have a biblical worldview when they graduate high school. Lord, just bless the club as the year's coming up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate that. My name is Mike Owens, and I uh, have a privilege of being a Sunday school uh, director here. Is that that's not the right word? Is it director? It is. That's, I said it right. Sorry. What am I? What do I do here? <clears throat> I am uh, going to dismiss our kids in just a second, but I really wanted to let you know that um, we have a new curriculum out this year, and I didn't get to tout it yet, but I wanted to tout it now and let you know we have family devotionals uh, for us parents, and we would love for you to pick them up and take them home and go over this with your students. Um, we can, uh, whether you're in 
first service, whether your children are in first service or not, Sunday school, these are great helpful guides uh, to guide through a, a family devotional if you don't have something already. If you have something already, fantastic, please use that. Um, but if you are looking for something to jumpstart your family worship time together, um, please um, come and grab one. They're over on the table inside where the check-in is. I just wanted to let you know we have those available for you because, uh, as I try to say as often as humanly possible, um, we are here to come alongside you parents. We are not here to take over for you parents. If you've come to drop off your kids and hope that church will raise godly kids for you someday, you've come to the wrong place, right? That is our job as parents. Um, us moms and dads, we are here. You have been put there to train up your kids in the way they should go in the Lord, to train them up and love on them and let them know who the Lord is. That is our job. Um, so don't, please, don't hope that you can drop your kids off at church and get some Christians at the end of the few years, okay? That's not how it goes. <clears throat> the Lord has placed you in their life to be the primary evangelists and disciplers of those kids. And we're excited to come alongside of you. And one way we get to do that is right here in our hands, is, um, in my hand, <laughs> is this family devotional. Um, if you need something like that. And they're great. They're pretty good. <clears throat> All right. I would like to, um, l I would love to just take a mo moment and, and pray uh, for our kids as they go off and for our teachers especially as they um, take on that amazing opportunity and uh, then we'll dismiss. Father God, we love you. We thank you for this opportunity and we do. We um, continually are reminded of uh, your love and grace and mercy as we are training up our kids. Um, they are mirrors uh, showing us our need for you. And uh, we thank you for that. Thank you for the reminder that we are uh, fallen people and we are in need of a savior. And we thank you for this time and this opportunity for our kids to hear your word preached. And we thank you for these many teachers who have taken up the task to study and prepare and, um, and proclaim your word. And we thank you for them. We pray that you would right now uh, use them mightily um, to come alongside these parents. We thank you so much for these parents. We pray for them as they have been uh, working so hard um, to communicate your love and grace and mercy uh, to their kids. We pray that you continue to give them perseverance and strength as they do that. We know that being a parent is not an easy job, but it is a good job. And we thank you for that. And thank you for giving us an example of how to do that, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, pre-K, preschoolers up to kindergartners, would you go through those double doors and how to take your parents to introduce them to your teachers, allow them to get to know each other a little bit. So if you'll take your parents through those doors, thank you very much. Don't hurt them. Man down. And first and second graders, you're going to follow through that door and you're going to meet your teacher at the end of the hall. First and second graders. And third and fourth graders. We, do, we have a Sunday school up to fourth grade during second service. We're uh, hoping that those in fifth grade and up can be with us. We really um, are excited about that. <clears throat> All right, the rest of us, would you please stand and greet one another, shake a hand, say hello, uh, to go find somebody you haven't met yet.
morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. If we can find our seats. <laughs> Good morning. If you find your seats and turn to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. <clears throat> I was told this morning I wouldn't have to bring you guys together that we're just going to play a video and turn off the lights and everyone would sit down. And I thought, not second service. <laughs> it was a challenge to get you guys back to your seats, but that's okay. It's a good challenge. I'm glad you like each other. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. <clears throat> and if you would, read along with me. Starting verse 10. Finally... Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand firm. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, Lord, I thank you, Lord, for this book of Ephesians as we get close to the end, Lord. I thank you for this last chapter, Lord, on the armor of God. God, I pray as we live in a materialistic culture, Lord, that that sees physical as reality and forgets that there is a reality out there that's non-physical, Lord, that there is a war going on in the spiritual realm, Lord. I pray as we go through this passage, Lord, that we're reminded that there is a war. There's a war fought over our souls, Lord. There's a war fought over your glory. And although we know we're victorious in Christ and what he has done on the cross, Lord, I pray that we put on the full armor, Lord, that you have offered your armor. That we stand firm, Lord, against the schemes of the devil. Be with us as a church, Lord, in your son's name. Amen. We're starting a new uh, sermon series on the armor of God and spiritual warfare. Of course, this is a very important subject. I know many of you have been excited to get to this passage. Many of you have been asking me every week, are we there yet? Well, we're there. (laughs) We're here. It's a very important subject, and we're going to take our time as we go through this final portion of Ephesians, mostly because there's a lot of misconceptions, I believe, on spiritual warfare within the church. So we're going to take our time, and today we're going to try to answer four questions. Actually, we're only going to get three of these four questions the four questions are these on the passage we just read. What, how, why, and who? What, how, why, and who? Again, we're only going to get through three of these questions this morning, and we'll answer the last question next week. But let's start with the what. The what of this passage. The what is be strong in the Lord. Look at verse 10 again. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Finally is a word that signals two things. It signals the beginning of a new paragraph or a new idea, and it also signals Paul's conclusion to this letter. It's a new idea, but it's also a final exhortation, a final command. Finally, and here's the command, be strong in the Lord. This is the overarching command, to be strong in the Lord. It's the overarching command of this passage on the armor of God and spiritual warfare. Paul is calling us as a church to be strong in the Lord. Now that word, be strong, it's two words in English, but in Greek it's one word. It's an interesting construction in this Greek word. It's one word again in Greek. It's in the present tense. And I've talked about this before here. The present tense in Greek, uh, the tense isn't as important as the aspect of a word. The aspect is the, this idea that this word is a continuous aspect. It's something that we're called to continuously do. It's the present tense, it's, it's passive, which is interesting because it's a command, it's imperative. It doesn't come from us, in other words. It's something that comes from outside of us, and again, it's an imperative, it's a command. It's present tense, it's passive, and it's a command. When you put these three, three concepts together, Paul is commanding us to continuously seek strength that comes from outside of us. 
One commentator put it this way, Paul both exhorts, commands his reader to action and also at the same time reminds them that the power for such action comes from an external source. It's not our strength. You know, this idea of being strong, this command, the church being strong and courageous, it's an idea that, that Paul comes back to often. In fact, it's a prayer that Paul had for this church, and I would say it's a prayer that Paul has for all of the churches he was a part of, and if he was around, it's a prayer that he would have for our church. We know this because Paul wrote out two different prayers for the church at Ephesus. One of them is found in Ephesians 3.14, and it says this, For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. I pray for you, in other words. Verse 15, for, for, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened. Praise that the church would be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. In fact, Paul taught Timothy to teach others be strong. 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 2, he says this, you then, my child, be strengthened, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust them to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. It's the last exhortation Paul gives the church at Corinth in his first letter. In 1 Corinthians 16, 13, he says this, a command, be watchful. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Paul wants the church to be strong and courageous. Strong and courageous. Look at verse 10 again, Ephesians 6, verse 10. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. There's actually three different words that are used here for strength, and we see it in English, strong, strength, and might. In Greek, be strong is dunamai, which is a word we get dynamite from. It means strength or power. Right? Be strong in the Lord in the strength. This is eskus. The last word, strength, is a different word in Greek. It means internal or inherent strength, the power um, one possesses. In other words, this is God's strength, the strength that God possesses that we should be seeking. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. This is kertos. This also means power or strength. But when this word is used always in Scripture, it's reference to supernatural power. It's God's supernatural power, God's supernatural strength. Look at Ephesians 6, 10 again. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. If you would, turn with me to Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. We see a similar command in the Old Testament from God to the nation of Israel, to Joshua, the leader of the nation of Israel. Joshua chapter 1, verse 1, says this, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I, will, that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Just real quick, the context of this passage, if you're not familiar, Joshua, Israel has been in the wilderness, the desert for 40 years now, wandering because of their sins. They were an enslaved people that have been freed but been wandering for 40 years. They're a pneumatic people. They're, they're uh, wanderers, and there's about a million of them. A massive nation at this point. Moses, their leader, has just died, and Joshua is called to lead Israel over the Jordan and into the promised land. Israel has been anticipating this for 40 years in the desert, and in fact, they've been anticipating this for like 400 years while they're in slavery, that one day they would be in the promised land that was promised to them. And look at Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. It says this, After the death of Moses, 
the servant of the Lord. You know, it's scary to lose a good leader. In fact, in warfare, one of the the main objectives of, of people that are in war is to take out the leader of an army. It will cause panic. Moses was one of the best leaders in all of Scripture. In fact, he's called the servant of the Lord. That title is not given to very many people. Moses was the leader of the government. He was the, the religious leader. He was the military leader. He was a prophet. In other words, he spoke for God, and he was a judge of Israel. He was a leader that had an intimate relationship with God, and now he is dead. Look at verse 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go. God tells Joshua, go. Go and lead my people. Hundreds of thousands of people, lead them. Lead them where? Lead them into war. Lead them into war. Cross the Jordan into the promised land where there will be war. Can you imagine how scary this would be for for Joshua? Look at verse 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I have promised to Moses from the wilderness of, the, of um, Lebion, as far as the great rivers of the Euphrates, and all of the land of the Hittites, to the great sea toward um, the going down of the sun shall be your territory. It's a massive land if you look at a map. It's all given to Israel by God. Look at verse 3, though. I think this is interesting. He says this, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I have promised to Moses. I have given to you. It's in present tense. It's not future tense. It's not I will give to you. I have given to you. The land was already theirs. In other words, the victory of the war was already won. They just had to step onto the land. They just had to have faith. They just had to be obedient to the command of God and walk onto the land. You know, when I was studying this and just kind of going through Joshua with this command of being strong, this portion of it reminds me really of Ephesians 1, 3, which we're all very familiar with. It just says this, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us, right? The church, he has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing that's in the heavenly places. In other words, the victory has already been won in Christ. We have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, peace, joy, rest, it's all ours. We just have to have faith and trust God and just walk in them. Look at verse 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or or forsake you. And then, therefore, look at verse 6. Be strong and courageous. Why? Why be strong and courageous? Because the victory is already won. I am with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. You have nothing to fear, Joshua. Be strong and courageous and just obey. Verse 6, be strong and courageous where you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. The second time time God tells Joshua to be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous, but be strong and very courageous. Which leads to a question. Strong in what? What strength? In Israel's military strength? No. No. Nomadic people, they've been wandering for 40 years. God calls them a stiff-necked people. There's nothing special inherently in, in Israel. 
Not only that, they're attacking walled cities where we're notoriously hard to attack. When God commanded Joshua to be strong, he meant be strong in your faith. Be strong in your faith. Trust me, Joshua. Trust me, not Israel's strength. So don't trust Israel's strength, but God's strength. Not your leadership skills. Just obey and trust. Be strong in your faith. Lead Israel into obedience by faith. Think about it, right? If you're familiar with Joshua, the, the book of Joshua, the first battle is Jericho, a massive walled city. There was no hope for Israel to destroy this, this nation of Jericho, the city of Jericho. And what did God tell Joshua to do and how to lead the Israelites into battle? To walk around the city seven times in seven days, then yell at the walls. Just think about that. I often wonder if Joshua, when he hears this from God, goes, that's embarrassing. <laughs> you, you seriously want me to walk around the seven times and then yell at the walls? You know, some of you might be feeling the same way. God, you want me to do what? Maybe you're being called to forgive someone. To love someone that's hurt you. Even if they're hard to love. Or really sinned against you. And God's calling you to forgive them. And God's saying, trust me. Maybe God's calling you to love your wife. And that's hard to do that right now. Or respect your husband. And he's not being honorable. And God is saying, trust me. Just be obedient. Or some of you may be struggling with some kind of addiction, struggling with pornography. And God is telling you to stop, get help, tell someone, get rid of your computer, get rid of your phone, get counseling. And you're saying, I can't, right? I'm embarrassed. I'm too ashamed to tell someone. And God is saying, trust me. Or maybe it's a medical diagnosis or hard circumstance and God is just asking you to walk faithfully through it. Trust me. Whatever it is, obedience at some times may just seem ridiculous to you. But God is saying, trust me. Listen, be strong and courageous. Trust God even when it's hard. Look at verse 7. Only be strong and very courageous. How? Listen to what he says. Be careful to do according to the, all the law that Moses, my servant, has commanded you. In other words, trust me by being obedient. Even if you don't understand, just obey and trust me. Look at verse 7. But again, only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law of Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Look at verse 8 again because there's a thought process that's going on here that I think is important. The, this book of the law, this is scripture. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that, here's the reason, you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. Then you will have good success. You will be blessed. You will be rewarded. You meditate on scripture to obey God, to trust God, to glorify God, to be blessed by God. Verse 9, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua, at this point, needed encouragement because he was heading to war. 
He was heading to war. He was going to lead God's people into war. And God says, be strong and courageous. Turn back to Ephesians 6, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in, in the strength of his might. Put on, or put on the whole armor of God. Think about that. Why do we need armor? Because we are at war. Christianity is war. Look what it says. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. We are at war. Christianity is war. The Bible is clear. We are at war. And, and think about this. We are living in the enemy's territory. Ephesians 2.2, 2, in fact, calls Satan the prince of the power of the air. He's the prince of this world. And his ways fill the air of this world. We're behind enemy lines and we're in war. Christianity is war. It's war against the flesh. It's war against lust. It's war against doubt. It's war against the, the, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. It's war against this world and it's not war against people, right? It's not flesh and blood. Paul makes that clear, but the evil world system that we're, we're in. It's everywhere. It hates God and hates his people. Listen, we are at war against sin. We are at war. We are in battle, and we need to be strong and courageous. We need to be strong and very courageous. We need to teach our young men, the next generation, that Christianity is war. We need to teach them to act like men. We need Josephs, we need Joshuas, we need Samuels, we need Davids. We need to teach our young women that, that Christianity is war. We need to teach them to be strong and courageous. We need Ruths, we need Esthers, we need Deborahs and Marys. Just think popular Christianity has sissified Christianity. We don't act like we're at war. And we see people get picked off left and right because of it. Marriage is falling apart because of it. Children walking away because of it. We need to lead the next generation into war. Like Joshua. Which leads to the next point. How? How are we to be strong and courageous? We need to know how if we're going to lead the next generation. We need to know how if we're going to be strong and courageous. How? How? Well, the answer is by putting on the whole armor of God. Look at verse 10 again, Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. In verse 11, this is how. Put on the whole armor of God. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this this morning because we're going to go in-depth in the armor of God in the next few weeks, but there's a couple of observations I want to make about the armor of God before we move on. The first one's this. This letter as a whole is a prison epistle. Right? Epistle means letter. Paul wrote this letter to the church at Ephesus while he was under house arrest in prison. In house arrest, he was chained to a Roman soldier, meaning as he was writing this probably, he was very familiar with the soldier's armor. He could just look at it. I think a lot of us have heard that before, but what I don't think most people realize is the average person in the Roman Empire was very familiar with a Roman soldier's armor too. The belt, the breastplate, the, the boots or shoes, the shield, the helmet, the two-edged sword. It was well known in the Roman Empire. It was common knowledge to the reader. The second observation 
I want to make is each physical part of the armor is related to a spiritual counterpart of God's armor. Right? The belt of truth. The breastplate of righteousness. The shoes given by the gospel of peace. The shield of faith. The helmet of salvation. The sword of of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Third observation, God's armor is for spiritual warfare, not physical warfare. The soldier's armor, the belt, the breastplate, the shoes, the helmet, the sword are all physical and useful in physical warfare, but useless in spiritual warfare. Truth righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith, salvation, the, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, are all very useful in spiritual warfare. This is the church's armor. This is what we should be armed with. Fourth observation. All the armor is defensive. Belt, breastplate, shoes, helmet, all of it's defensive besides one thing, the sword. The church's only offensive weapon that it possesses is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. The proclamation of God's Word, the proclamation of, of the gospel. And, and I just want to say something the Word of God is powerful. Amen. You know, it's one of the reasons when I get up here, I don't give a lot of illustrations. I hope I don't give my ideas because that's not powerful. The Word of God is powerful. In fact, Hebrews 4.12 says this, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. A fifth observation, verse 11, says, Put on the whole armor of God. Fifth observation is this, The armor is God's armor. It's not ours. In fact, you see the armor throughout the whole Old Testament of of God's character and how he uses it. It's God's armor. It's just like God's strength. It's not our strength. It's his armor that was given to Jesus who used it victorious and, and then Jesus has passed it down to us. We get the privilege of wearing God's armor. We are called to be strong in the Lord, to be warriors ready for battle. How? By putting on the whole armor of God. Which leads to a third question. Why? Why? Why should we put on the whole armor of God? Why? Well, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that, here's why, that you may be able to stand. That you may be able to stand. We are called to stand. There's something that's interesting that I want to point out. I've read a lot of commentaries on the book of Ephesians as a whole, and a lot of people think the armor of God part was just this kind of final exhortation that doesn't fit into the letter as a whole. I don't think that's the case. I think Paul had this thought that goes through the whole book of Ephesians, and of course, we've spent so much time in this book, it's deep. But I want to go, just quick review of some of the things that we have covered Right? Remember, chapter 1 through 3, we've said this a number of times, is, is the deep truth of God's grace poured out on us. The first three chapters are these deep truths of God's grace poured out on us. In chapters 1 through 3, we were seated. In fact, turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, which I think is the heart of chapters 1 through 3. It's the gospel. Again, we've gone over this so much, I haven't memorized Chapters, Ephesians 2, 1, says this. I think most of us have it memorized by now. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the, this world, following the prince of power of the air, the, the spirit that is now at works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And verse 6, and he raised us up with him, and he seated us with him. 
in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Listen, we didn't sit down. We were seated. God seated us. God was active. We were passive. It happened to us. Look at verse 4 again. It says this, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he, this is God, made us alive. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Verse 6, he, this is God, he raised us up with him. And he, listen, he seated us with him. In the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, we were seated. God acting, we were passive. It happened to us. And look at verse 6. Closely, it says this, he seated us. It's past tense. In other words, it's already happened. As soon as you were saved, you were seated. What does it mean to be seated? It's an important question to ask. It means we are victorious. We are victorious in Christ. We are at rest, seated. The victory has already been won, and we didn't do it. Christ did. That's what it means to be seated. In fact, turn to Hebrews 10:11. and this is an important passage. Hebrews 10, 11. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11 says this, and every priest, this is talking about Old Testament, what the priest did in the Old Testament, every priest stands, it's important, stands, Every priest stands daily at his service. In other words, every priest daily was working. Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. Animal sacrifice of the Old Testament can't take away sins. Therefore, priests would stand daily and sacrifice over and over and over again and yet it did nothing. It didn't take away sins. It just pointed forward to the one that does take away sins. Verse 12, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, Christ, the Lamb of God, who died on the cross once and for all, a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Why did he sit? Because the work is done. He's victorious. It's over. He's at rest. The Old Testament priests kept sacrificing, kept working, and they were never done. But after Jesus' sacrifice, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. Again, Ephesians 2, verse 6 says, God raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are victorious in Christ. Just like Christ, we are waiting for his second coming. If you're a Christian this morning, listen, you are victorious. You know what that means? It means nothing can hurt you. Nothing can hurt you. That's why Romans 8, 31 says, What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, he was raised, who is at the right hand of God, victorious, who indeed is interceding for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ, shall tribulations or distress or persecutions or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. That's war language. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, there is nothing that can hurt us. We are more than conquerors. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's why Paul can say in Philippians 1, 20, 21, for to me it's to live is to Christ and die is gain. To live is Christ and die is gain. You can't hurt Paul. Throw him in prison. Christ is glorified. To live is Christ. Beat him. Christ is glorified. To live is Christ. Set him free. He goes and preaches. Christ is glorified. To live is Christ. Kill Paul, gain. He goes to heaven. To die is gain. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Listen, there's nothing that could hurt him. He knew it. That's why he lived so boldly. You know, there's one of two things that happened when Paul entered a new city. Either a riot or revival. <laughs> That's it. And probably jail time, either way. He knew he was victorious in Christ. And he lived boldly. It's the main reason we can be strong and courageous because just like Paul, the victory is won, our future is set. That's why he wrote Ephesians 1 through 3. I know Paul meditated on, on these chapters, it was just in his heart. And he wrote it out to give to the church so they would be bold so they would know how blessed they are, so we would know how blessed we are, so that we would live boldly. Ephesians 1 through 3, we were seated. It's passive. It's God's work. It happened to us, and, and we are blessed. Therefore, we get to Ephesians 4 through 6, where we're called to walk. Called to action. Called to live boldly like Paul. Ephesians 1 through 3, we were seated. It was passive. It happened to us. We were blessed by God with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Ephesians 4 through 6, we were called to walk, to actively live. Ephesians 1 through 3, there's one imperative. We've talked about this. It's all indicatives. Imperatives, a command, indicative is just statements of fact. It's statements about what happened to us. Ephesians 1 through, through 3. Ephesians 4 through 6, there's 39 imperatives, 39 commands. It's how you should walk in light of the truth, how we should live in light of God's grace. Turn to Ephesians 4.1. We're familiar with this. In Greek, the first word is therefore, not I. Therefore. Therefore, because all these truths in, in Ephesians 1 through 3, because of God's grace that's been poured out on us, therefore, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to walk in a matter worthy of the calling in which you have been called. In other words, live boldly. Ephesians 1 through 3, we were seated. Ephesians 4 through 6, we were called to walk. I just, if we understood how blessed we truly were, or are, we would live boldly. We're called to walk. We're called to action. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Ephesians 4, 17. Look at verse 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. You, you shouldn't walk any, any more as the pagans do in the fertility of their minds, but instead walk in love. Look at Ephesians 5, verse 2. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. We're, we're called as Christians to walk in love. We're called as Christians to walk as children of light. Ephesians 5 verse 8. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. We're called to walk in wisdom. Look at Ephesians 5 verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. We're called to walk. We're called to action. And listen, all the, all the credit, all the glory goes to God, even for our action. 
fact, that's why Ephesians 2.10, which Craig read this morning, we, we didn't talk about this at all. It says this, for, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should just walk in them. All we have to do is walk. It reminds me of Joshua 1. The victory was already won. The land was already given to Joshua. All he had to do was walk in that victory. Walk onto the land. Yeah, it's war, but it's already won. He just had to walk in obedience. Joshua 1, 3, in fact, says, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. It's already won, Joshua, just walk. In a similar way, we are victorious in Christ. The victory is already won. We're called to walk in that victory. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. Listen, Ephesians 1 through 3, we were seated. We were seated. It's passive. It happened to us. We are victorious in Christ. Ephesians 4 through 6, we are called to walk. It's active. We're called to walk in victory, walk in love, walk in light, walk in, in wisdom, walk in unity to the glory of God. Ephesians 6, 10 through 24, verses 10 through 24, we are called to stand. We are called to stand, to hold our ground. Look at Ephesians 6, verse 11. Ephesians 6, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Look at verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand firm. Look at verse 14. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Think about it. Ephesians 1 through 3, we were seated passively, happened to us. Ephesians 4 through 6, verse 9, we were called to walk. It's active. It's what we're called to do. Ephesians 6, 10 through the end, we're called to stand. When it comes to word war, standing is holding your ground, and it's both active and passive. Think about it. We're actively standing, actively defensive, passively waiting for the action to come to us. Remember, all the armor talked about besides the sword is defensive. It's defensive. And that's because the devil will attack. We don't need to seek him out. He will attack. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Listen, we're called to be ready by putting on the whole armor of God. That's my introduction to this passage, the armor of God. <laughs> Ran out of time to get into it. I'm excited to be in the armor of God. I don't know if there's ever been a time in my life that the church has needed to hear about the armor of God more than today. It's going to cost something to be strong and courageous for our young women and children in this church. We need to raise our families and our kids, our girls and boys to be men and women in the Lord, to stand strong and courageous. What? The command is to be strong in the Lord. How? By putting on the armor of God. Why? To stand against the schemes of the devil. Next week, we're going to look at who we're fighting against. And then we'll look at the therefore. But I want to end today with a quote by Ian Dug Dugged. He says this, So be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Take your stand against the devil, protected by the armor that God has provided. Fight the good fight with all your might. Wrestle with all the energy that the Spirit gives you. Be in the midst of the standing and fighting and wrestling, don't forget to rest in the finished victory of Christ and the assurance that the Spirit's perfect 
sancti sanctifying work in your life is what counts. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, Lord, we need to be strong and courageous. We need your strength. Lord, be with us as a church, Lord. Help us to rest in the victory, Lord, to have faith that there's spiritual realities that are outside this physical world that we get our, get our eyes and minds off just what's happening physically here, Lord. That we know we will be with you for eternity. That we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, Lord. I, I know sometimes as we walk through life, it, it doesn't feel that way. Sometimes we don't have peace or, or joy or rest, yet we do. Help us to realize that so we can live boldly, Lord, in harsh circumstances, Lord. Help us to live boldly for you, Lord. Help us raise the next generation to live boldly. There are young men and women. God, I pray for them. Who knows what the future holds here? You, you do, Lord. We pray for our country, Lord. I pray that this, this country turns and, and, and becomes a godly country once again, Lord. But I know it's going to be hard for Christians to be Christians if we keep going the direction we're going, Lord. And so we're going to need your strength. Be with us, Lord. In your son's name, amen. If you would uh, stick around for a second. We have announcements. Craig, this, you're absolutely right, man. This is tough to follow after, after Nathan's been up here and the, all the worship team and all the good stuff that's happened. But, hey, I want to let you know what's going on around your church. In the back, make sure you grab these little handouts. There's an orange one, white one, and a pink one. Uh, there's some different new ways to give. You notice we're not passing the offering plate, so there's some ways that you can give. Take a look at that on the um, orange piece of paper. Obviously, this is just skimming over everything because I know you're all hungry and want to go grab something to eat, right? Uh, if you got that email about the new church directory, or if you didn't, grab one of these and see how you can stay connected with the church. Um, and then I want to encourage you all to grab one of the pink sheets here and look at it. There's quite a bit of things going on. Uh, it's Pastor Appreciation Month. We've got Nathan and Craig and, and the elder board around here. But when you guys get a chance, give them a hug and bless them, okay? Um, you notice the shoeboxes are, are back here. We've got the Operation Christmas Child going on, so make sure you grab a shoebox and fill those things up. And then I am excited next week, directly after service, we are going to take advantage of those beautiful sails and that green grass out on the back area before it gets too cold, and you know that's coming, right? It's right around the corner. But we're going to barbecue out there. So I encourage first service to come back. I'm going to encourage you all to step back there. We got 800 hot dogs coming, and they're not the grocery store hot dogs. You know, they're the we call them the Henry dogs for years. We get them from Jeff Gadzia nowadays, but they're the restaurant quality hot dogs. I'm not a big hot dog guy, and I love these things, okay? So come on back. We're going to have some hot dogs, and we'll have waters and sodas and chips and the stuff to go with, and just a chance to eat together and fellowship together, okay? So, um, and if we can pump the smell in some way um, to, to second service, we'll get you all, hopefully. Okay. Um, you are dismissed. Be blessed and be strong and courageous. <laughs>